one. Greetings, everybody. Welcome. Super excited to have you join us. With me, I have an amazing guest, an amazing leader. She goes by the name of Leah. What's going on, Leah? Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you doing? Good. Everything's good. Why don't, why don't you, how do you, how do you introduce yourself? What do you like to, to share when you first meet people? Okay, so I guess to start with my name. My name is Leah Williams. I'm a proud, proud, proud member of the Floridian family from St. Petersburg, Florida. And I just graduated from Spelman College like a month ago. Which oh, is so wow. <laughs> One month ago. Still, still, still crazy. Um, I love to read. I'm a book enthusiast. And I also love to just like be outside. It's probably the Florida thing, though. <laughs> What was the, the first thing that you said? You're a proud member of what? The Floridian family, as I called it. Oh, okay. That you're from Florida? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, you love books. What, what's, what's a, are you reading a book right now? Yes. Yeah, so I have just a chapter left of Angie Martinez's My Voice book. It's a book about her life and her time at Hot 97. If you're into rap at all, it's a big radio station in New York City. And her stories are crazy. Actually, they're really, really good. Really? Yeah. She has, um, I mean, from interviewing Tupac to like intimate times with Jay-Z. It's like super cool if you're into rap. That's awesome. Do, do you mind if after we if we offer our listeners a free giveaway of your top five most recommended books. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay. When we're done with the interview, I'll get those from you. And folks listening right now, if you want that PDF, just head over to tomearl.com slash blog and we'll, we'll get you a free download of Leah's top five most recommended books. So, so cool. what was your major? I majored in economics while I was at Spelman, and it's interesting because I kind of fell into it, but I ended up loving it. I love, love, love economics. Tell me about it. What do you, what do you love about it? I think it has so many intersections um, because especially studying economics at Spelman, which is a historically black college, we talked a lot about income inequality and how some of the things that happen in society affect money and um, resources and the way that those resources are distributed. So I started um, picking up on things that I didn't really understand until I started studying economics. And it's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's why that is the way it is, which isn't always good. <laughs> what would be an example of some uh, time where you were studying or learning and you were like, okay, I get it now. Like, oh, that makes sense. What, what was an example of something like that? Yeah, so definitely when it came to school. So in um, my school, I noticed that some of our books were kind of raggedy, kind of dated. But then when you would go North County, the books would be new and they would be nice. And they're, they were very, very funded. They were able to do things that my school in the South County couldn't do because it was predominantly black and I'm thinking like why is that you know we all get state funding like our school should be the same but um, a lot of it has to do with um, property taxes so a lot of schools are funded through property taxes and in neighborhoods whether the homes are bigger or smaller if it's predominantly black the value is going to be lower so that mm -hmm. means less money for the school so that's like a big connection that I made and I'm thought like wow that's really messed up but mm. <laughs> yeah so what, what do you think are the, the impacts of, you know, the school system then being tied to property tax and because of devaluation of homes and stuff like that, schools are getting different funding? What, what impact do you think that has? I think life outcomes, um, education has a big part of your lifestyle that you're able to live for the most part. So I think a lot, unfortunately, a lot of students that are coming out of schools in lower income areas, it's like this cycle of poverty that they enter. I don't think exists in the North County or predominantly white neighborhoods. So I think if we could get people um, in schools that are heavily supported, even more so supported in lower income areas, I think that will help a lot to end some of that cyclical po poverty that, um, happening in the u.s these days <laughs> okay and just for the folks who don't know uh st petersburg county politics could you kind of break down what you mean when you're saying north and the south because some people might think you mean north and south 
of the United States? Okay, yeah. So in St. Petersburg, though beautiful, it's highly, highly segregated. So for the most part, um, the south of the south of the city um, is predominantly black and uh, Hispanic, and we have the North County, which is predominantly white. And the schools that um, are in the North County, um, even in and vice versa. Okay, cool. Um, you're, you, you froze while you're giving the explanation. Do you mind giving it one more time? Sure, no problem. So in the North County of St. Petersburg, so that's probably where like we have the street called Central Street and up, that's predominantly white. And we have Central Street and more so south of that street is predominantly black. And that's where we have like the north of the North St. Petersburg and South St. Petersburg. Okay, got you, got you. And so then in, in Florida, or at least in St. Pete, they also try to do like magnet schools. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that? So we have magnet programs. The target for the programs is integration. So, um, so the neighborhoods are segregated as I talked about through South County, predominantly black, North County, predominantly white. So they have have these magnet schools so where you can go to a school it doesn't matter what neighborhood that you live in but even with these programs it's still highly segregated um you find that even in the predominantly black schools that the magnet programs are mostly of white students and they're treated a bit differently in my experience and they're kind of separated so it's still not true inclusion and integration mm. okay got you so then when they have a program that's supposedly supposed to integrate the schools or create diversity, then the schools are still then become segregated places even within themselves is what I'm hearing. Yeah. And um, I think also through my studies at Spelman, um, for those who don't know, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum was our president at one time. And she's so amazing. She's <laughs> awesome. She wrote this book, um, Why Are All the Black Kids on like a part in the cap in the back of the cafeteria and she did this awesome lecture about it so even when they say oh my school is so diverse we have all these groups of people people still tend to um segregate themselves by race for a multitude of reasons so again even outside of economics i still feel like school just helped me understand the world better Definitely. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Amazing book. Highly recommend it. Yeah. So, so kind of what you were just talking about now, where you're saying how then, you know, even within a diverse school, if you go into the cafeteria, people will say, well, everybody's segregated. Some right. people will say then, well, that's just natural. We're supposed to be like that. It's a natural thing that diversity and inclusion and all that's not natural. What do you, what do you say or what are your thoughts on when people say something like that? I think that those behaviors have to be unlearned. So I think we, we are socialized um, to an extent, but that doesn't mean it's okay. So when you're little and say, I have an older sister and I would like snatch things out of her hair, like, no, she corrected me. So I feel like it's the same thing, right? Once you recognize these behaviors, maybe question, question um, yourself, like, why am I doing this? And try to get out of it as well. Okay, so I heard you say that thing like unlearn and socialized. So do you, th are you, do you think it's natural or is it like a learned thing where we self-segregate? I think it's a learned thing. So, I mean, I don't think we're born that way, but I think over time you kind of, learn these behaviors and you internalize them you just act on them without thinking and how does somebody go about unlearning that then i think the first part is to recognize it i mean you can't change something that you don't recognize so i think it's that level of self-awareness maybe looking around your surroundings and saying like huh let me assess my circle how diverse are my real friends that I like hang out with, mm. not just pass in the hallway. And then once you recognize that, you know, that's an issue, make that effort to go out and extend um, the olive branch and talk to people, join activities that you may not have participated before so you can truly build relationships. 
That's awesome. And have you ever had an experience like that yourself where you, you did just what you were saying where you extended yourself or went outside your comfort zone to create a space of inclusion? Yeah, I actually have like a pretty funny story about that. So um, though I went to a historically black college and Spelman's also a women's college, we still have these layers um, to us. And I think that's with class. So mostly with Spelman, I would say majority of the population is probably about middle class. Um, and maybe you have a few um, who are higher class too. So. I think I've looked around and said like, wow, all of my friends come from middle-class families. Like mm. they are got to be students that are, you know, not from middle-class family. So um, there was a student that was in my class and she shared a bit about her story coming from a low income family, some of her struggles. So I said, um, I talked to her about it and she said, oh my gosh, you should totally come with me to my next like family gathering. So we went, I went with her to, um, it's at about 20 minutes outside of Atlanta and it's a, almost felt like I was in a different city. Really? But I felt like I could understand like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Class is something else. Um, but I felt like I could understand her more and her perspective more and it actually got me, um, the opportunity to talk to different people of different classes and understand how class can also affect us, even though we all are black women. Mm. That's a great example and story. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. What do you think then kind of going off that example? Because a lot of people are saying these days that there is no racism, that really what it is is classism, that class is the big problem. Race is not a problem. We should stop talking about it. What, do you, what are your thoughts on when people say that? Not at all. So I think that all of these things intertwine, right? Because we have layers to us as people. So like I said, though I am a Black woman, um, yes, that puts me in a minority group, but I'm also middle class. So we have that added layer of experience. So I feel like, and also race and racism and classism often are hand in hand. So to say that class is the new race isn't isn't I would say I don't agree with that viewpoint but um because they all all of our different identities kind of um inform our experiences that's very true I agree with that <laughs> yeah um and so just to share uh how do you and I know each other so in high school, which is many moons ago now, which is crazy, <laughs> um, Tom was then working with Community Tampa Bay, who still does awesome, amazing, amazing work. And we are working with, um, in partnership with the Tampa Bay Rays, with facilitating the leadership of youth. So we will put on these awesome youth, youth summits about um, different topics that involve diversity and inclusion. So we talked about gender and we talked about race and it was super awesome and it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. The whole experience changed my life. I appreciate Community Tampa Bay and Any Town program for doing that. What about for you? How, what was that like having that foundation in high school, moving forward into college and everything like that? What was that like having that background of leadership skills to end discrimination? I think that it helped me find what I was passionate about um, because it kind of pushed you when you're hosting these leadership summits, you're having to get in front of people and develop these skills, but these skills are transferable. So um, I went on to actually intern with diversity and inclusion on a corporate side. And it was cool to see how my foundation and things that I learned at any town, I could share with adults who didn't know it. So um, I was able to translate it that way and also through some of the mentoring programs that I did and kind of check them when I hear things so that the youth um, they're informed and they're practicing good behaviors. So you, you had an internship where you were uh, like facilitating with adults about diversity and inclusion? Yeah and it was amazing to me I guess I saw the generational divide um, because things that are kind of common now, I guess, wasn't really talked about. Um, so when we talked about things like sexual orientation and how gender is a spectrum, it was like mind blowing. Like, 
what? I never thought of that. Like, um, and being younger and coming with that knowledge, I think kind of gave me a leg up in that arena. Do you, do you like having those kind of conversations and facilitating um, dialogue around diversity? I love it. I think it's so necessary, especially in a setting like that. It was at a corporation. So I feel like oftentimes people are taught not to be their whole selves at work or talk about important things at work. But at the end of the day, you don't stop being a person because you're at your job, right? So a lot of the things that happen in society and just your identity in general is going to come with you. So we have to talk about it to make sure that everyone's treated the way that they're supposed to be treated. How do you talk about it then? What do you do? I think the biggest thing that you can do, even if you're not in a position to host these kind of trainings, is to check um, behaviors. So I think a lot of people experience these microaggressions and you're taught to kind of brush it off and not say anything about it, but you have to, or it's going to keep um, happening. Mm -hmm. What, what would you say is like, so somebody's listening to this and they're inspired and they're like, I want to start talking about issues like race and gender, sexual orientation. What would you say is one or two things that they could start doing? Well, one, I noticed that people love to talk about books they read. Okay. So say if you read like an interesting article or like you read a book about it, you can say, hey, have you ever heard of, I don't know, maybe some scholar or articles? Like, yeah, this article is discussing like racism or police brutality. Like, and then it kind of opens that discussion. And if you feel like someone is reluctant to talk about it, because often they are, um, just say, hey, like this is a safe space, like no judgment. And people tend to warm up to you. That's awesome. So just inviting the conversation and letting people know that this is going to be a safe place to talk about it. Is that, is that a good way to, and, and to use articles and things people might have already seen? Is that what I was hearing you say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Creating a safe space. That's awesome. And don't forget, if you want to learn what are Leah's top five favorite books, <laughs> and then you can use those to start a conversation, the, just click the link in the show notes below. Otherwise, tomearl.com slash blog, and you'll find a way right there to download Leah's top five most recommended books. So I reached out to some folks from people we both mutually know from any town <laughs> and allowed them to submit some questions. Do you know who Sarah Agni is? Oh, I love Sarah with an H, of course. Sarah's <laughs> how, so awesome. How do you know Sarah with an H? She was, when I was in the Anytown program during the summer, so Anytown, for those of you who don't know, it uh, starts in the summer and you have no phones, which is like really nervous for teenagers, <laughs> but it's super awesome. And it's like intense um, workshops and activities about um, everything. Um, pertaining to inclusion and diversity and leadership. So it starts with that week and then you continue on with the different initiatives that Community Tampa Bay has. And while I was there, she was actually um, my like, I don't know, we don't call them RAs. I can't remember the name, but she lives with me in my dorm and facilitated those dialogues and she's super awesome. So. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, I love that intro. So one of her questions is, what is your favorite thing that you love about yourself? The favorite thing that I love about myself, I would say my ability, my open-mindedness. I'm, there's not many things in this world that like I won't do or won't try or like won't listen to. So I think that has made a pretty good life experience for me. That's awesome. How, how do you become open-minded? Say yes more. Okay. <laughs> I think when you say yes to more opportunities and you just try different things, it helps you first learn about yourself and then others. And I think also engaging with people you wouldn't normally engage in and make that effort. So even if it's like uncomfortable to like talk to people you may not know, it'll definitely help you become more open-minded. That's awesome. Did, did you read Year of Yes? I have not, but I've heard that it's awesome. Shonda Rhimes book. Yeah, yeah exactly. I need to. It's really good. I, I listened to it on Audible and she actually reads it. So that's, that's even better. Shonda Rhimes is so cool. I agree. Are, are you a fan of her shows? I love all of her shows. Even though like they make me a little bit anxious and nervous, I still love her shows. Yeah. I just remembered that 
um, the first time you watched Scandal, you came in like the next week to fly and we're like, I just watched Scandal on Netflix and I'm hooked. I just I'm remember. so hooked. <laughs> I was there. there. I'm so hooked. <laughs> That's how I learned about it too. I watched season one on um, uh, Netflix and was like, oh my gosh, I got to start watching this. <laughs> I literally watched it for two days. Like, yeah. did not leave the house. And it was so great. Um, Sarah has one more question. What would you say was your experience of going to a historically black college? What was what would would that be like versus not going to one? Oh man, going to historically black college, especially like women's historically black college, helped me to see things. Um, of, because you're in this environment that you don't have this label of gender and race, it helps you explore other areas of yourself so i think oftentimes you're tokenized like oh the smart black girl but like okay everyone's a smart black girl so like you're the funny fashionable smart black girl who loves to ride a bike um that's so awesome it's like being in an environment where you don't have those labels you get to know yourself more and um even through the curriculum i mean the black female scholars that I was exposed to at Spelman was life-changing. I mean, Alice Walker came to speak and wow. hearing a lecture by Kimberly Crenshaw, like wow. Melissa Harris Perry, like amazing oh, wow. black woman. Oh, it was so great. But um, I mean, I didn't go to a school that wasn't historically black college, but something that I noticed is that their race plays way more into their day-to-day -day interactions and um, especially with the curriculum mm -hmm. they don't necessarily get exposed to it um unless they take these courses and it's just integrated so i think it's different experiences i want to say one over the other but i definitely love 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 my experience that's awesome i appreciate you sharing that sure okay so we also had another person jessica estevez you remember jessica of course <laughs> How do, how do you know Jessica? So Jessica was the, she was with Community Tampa Bay at the time, and she was the director of the Anytown program when I went through, and she was an amazing actor on the last day. I don't know if everyone has went, so I don't want to, like, give yeah, no, no spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> but she's also an amazing actress. So, she's, again, someone who's super, super awesome and amazing. That's great. And, and she wants to know, what is a story of healing that inspires you? A story of healing? Oh, I love Maya Angelou and her story. Mm. Um, I read all of her books. Um, I wish I could put all of them on my top five, but it will kind of crowd the space. But <laughs> <laughs> her autobiography, it's just seeing how she overcame so much. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of that was through self-reflection and transparency and mm. she was able to share that to the world why like, mm. so amazing to me and i think she's like one of my heroes yes indeed also another book where she reads her autobiography if people are into um audiobooks she reads her own so highly recommend i'm a big fan of audiobooks so yeah especially her because her voice is so soothing I <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you said self-reflection and transparency. How, yeah. how does somebody cultivate self-reflection and transparency? How do you become someone like that? Well, I have more of like a system. I'm kind of one of those strategic organizing people. So I have this journal and I think journaling is like the best way to self-reflect because you have to like think about what you did during the day. And um, so I asked myself one question, what's something awesome that I did today? Mm. What's something that was kind of like not awesome that I did today? And what are things that I'm grateful for? So it makes me think about um, my day-to-day -day interactions and it helps me become more transparent because I have it written down so I, I can talk about it. Like if I do something to a friend, it's like, hey, are you cool with that? Like, was that cool or maybe not cool? So I, that's like my way. Do you write it all as like a free write or do you have the three questions and you write underneath each question? I free write it, but I, ask, I do kind of like fill out each question with like a little bullet point, but nothing too fancy, yeah. And how long have you been doing that? 
I started doing that about two years ago. I've always loved to write. Um, but I think when I got in college with the hustle and bustle of everything, I just kind of put it to the wayside and got to a point where I felt like, okay, I think mental health for college students is really important. And I felt my mental health was not in the place it needed to be. So I needed to get some systems in order to get it back where it should be. So that's where I came up with the three things that you're grateful for. Because even when you like maybe failed a test and like financial aid is like playing with your money, you're like, oh my gosh, everything's going wrong. <laughs> There's a silver lining in life, always, always. And did you hear that idea somewhere or did you just uh, think of it and go for it? I got it from my mom. I think she said she read an article that that's like a good behavior somewhere. So I thought, huh, maybe I should try it. And it definitely works. I would recommend that to everyone. I'm just totally smiling because I don't think there's a single episode that goes by on this podcast where I don't tell people to write down three gratitudes every day on a sheet of paper. So I'm like, I didn't set this up, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually really awesome. I think everyone should do it. That's amazing. And I like your question of what did I do that was awesome today and what's something that I didn't think was awesome or I should improve upon. Awesome yeah. questions too. And you prefer to write it rather than type it? Yeah, I'm old school. I still do pen and paper. That's awesome. I dig that. Um, so let's see here. And do you know Monique Harris? Yeah. We were together in Sly. She was also a facilitator, youth leader, someone super energetic and positive. Always, always, always. And she just graduated too. Also a graduate. It's so <laughs> <Yeah>. crazy. <laughs> so she wants to know, how has your perspective of life changed since we were all together five years ago? Oh, wow. So much, I feel. Um, a lot. So <laughs> I guess i would be more specific than that. So for one, I feel like I'm, I thought I was open-minded and understanding, but now I feel like I'm very more cognizant of others and myself because I have kind of gone through some things and had to reassess myself sometimes so that's one two I definitely don't think take things as serious like I said um, during my sophomore year in college I felt like the stress was starting to get to me and my mental health was not where it needed to be so I had to learn like okay yeah it seems like it's the end of the world but it's kind of not like, mm. it's okay. Take care of yourself, eat properly, work out. Self-care is super, super important. And don't let work get in the way of that. What do you mean by not take yourself so seriously or not take things so seriously? What do you mean by that? So I was, I'm a person, I like to put a hundred percent in everything, but sometimes things just don't go wrong and I can't take things go wrong and I would like take that personally and think that that was like a reflection of myself but that's just a reflection of life like things just happen that sometimes are out of my control and I can't take it so personal mm. Do, have you read any books or heard any lectures or had any mentors that helped you in that process Actually, it was another student. So she was brave enough to tell her story about how um, she was so stressed out about school and like getting the perfect grades and being involved in all these activities that it took a toll on her mental health. And she had to um, take a step back from her education and just take a semester just to clear her brain. And I thought like, wow, that could be me if I don't take care of myself. Mm. Um, she really stressed self-care, taking that time to go to sleep, take care of yourself, decompress. Um, and when she showed her story, shared her story, I thought like, okay, some of these behaviors she said she was doing, I definitely do those. So how about I like take time to myself and schedule in self-care like I was scheduling going to work or typing a paper. That's amazing. I totally yeah. agree with all of those things and I'm totally smiling because I'm like, yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I totally agree. And that's a, a huge part of what this podcast is about is giving people tools and a space to reflect upon that. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard you say it now maybe two or three times that you had a big epiphany or a moment of clarity through somebody telling their story. Do yeah. You, do you find that storytelling is uh, important or is that a theme in your life that storytelling has impacted you in a big way? 
Definitely. I think storytelling for me is when I get like those moment of clarities. And I think it's something about someone being willing to share what they've been through that always resonates with me. So it's like, yeah, I can read it in a book and um, maybe not see how it's see the theory I guess of it but when you see someone who's actually been through it and like see the end result of it it's like okay I can kind of relate to that you see yourself in that person and what is this what is the story that you share about yourself with people the story that I would share I would say that transition from high school to college was really hard for me. And I felt like everyone around me was like, oh my gosh, college is so awesome. And it was, but I was the first semester of college, I was not feeling it. I'm like, no, this is hard. This is hard on my mental health. Like this is, I'm not with my friends. Um, I'm outside of my comfort zone. And I feel like that's a story that people don't really talk about. It's just more so talk about the positive sides. But um, I think I've, how did I cope and came out of that is important, especially when I'm mentoring some of my girls who are about to leave. Like, it's okay not to like college when you first get there. It's mm-hmm. okay to ask for help or tell someone, you know, I had a terrible day. We don't have to put on this space all the time. That's, that's very powerful. And I believe it applies to people doing a lot of things, you know, where you get that perfect job you thought was going to be great and it's like, it's not what I thought it was going to be or lots of areas of our lives. Yeah. What, what would you recommend then to somebody who's in that situation, whether it's college or some aspect of their life where they get in and everybody seems cool. You feel like the one who's not and you don't want to yeah. tell anybody. What would you recommend to them? Well, one, I would first share it with someone because sometimes we go through things and we think that we're the only one going through them but most times we're not so if you have someone that you feel comfortable talking about it with just talking it out definitely helps um and then sometimes i also made had this decision of like okay is this something that i need to come out of or is this something that i feel like i can push through and it will get better and I knew with college, I loved SPUM and I loved the foundation of the school. I felt like it was something I just could like push through and it ended up working and it was a great experience. But um, sometimes situations are just toxic and it's not something that you can push through. Mm. So once you self-reflect, maybe take yourself out of that situation if it's really putting a toll on you. That's awesome. So I'm hearing talk about it. And then sometimes fake it till you make it isn't the right strategy that sometimes yeah. you got to bless and release and move on. Yeah. yeah exactly. powerful. So kind of con- wrapping up here, I'm curious to know what are some questions that are, are kind of like guiding you or that you're asking yourself, you know, right now or throughout 2017? This year, it's like now that I'm done with school and like I have a job, it's like, okay, what's next? Because it's like, okay, finish elementary schools, middle school, like with education, it's kind of continuous. But now that's over. It's like, I can direct that energy elsewhere. So I think I'm asking myself, what is my purpose? What do I love to do? And how can I do more of it? And I heard you say earlier that like any town and community Tampa Bay helps you find your passion. Yeah. And, and now you're, I hear you're saying one of the questions too, is you're looking for your purpose and stuff like that. How, yeah. how does somebody find their purpose? How do you answer questions like that once you start asking them? What do, you, what do you think are some pathways on that journey? So I think, well, I'm still kind of working through that. But first I'm assessing like what makes me happy. Mm-hmm. And then what am I really good at? What are my natural talents? And then how do you channel that, those talents? So I know something that I absolutely love to do and I'm super passionate about is mentoring because like you said, stories are super important to me and they've been pivotal to me. So I feel this obligation to kind of lead it on and I love to talk to people and build relationships. So now I did that through the school and now that I'm not in school, I need to find another avenue to kind of do that. And I'm kind of weighing, should I create my own avenue or is it something that I could probably participate in an existing program? So I'm still kind of working that out but um even beyond that i feel everything that i went through was for a purpose so kind of reflecting on some of the things that happened in my life and say huh maybe i'm supposed to take this route so let mm. me continue <laughs> i feel like leah williams just gave y'all like 
a roadmap for finding your passions in 2017. So, oh, yeah, fine, fine, so. <laughs> yes, indeed. I hope y'all rewind that and listen to it. If you're, if you're in a place where you're searching for your journey in 2017, that was great advice. Thanks. I'm still working on it. So, um, are you cool if folks want to let you know they appreciated something or ask you a clarifying question? Are you cool with them reaching out to you? Yeah, sure. So you could find me on Facebook, Leah Williams, and also my email is Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, Leah, L-E-A-H, 06 at gmail.com. Williams, Leah, 06 at gmail.com? Yeah. Perfect. So let Leah know if there's something you appreciated um, and if there is any questions you have. Kind of wrapping up and concluding, um, you know, our, the celebration is a place for leadership, inclusion, and expression. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your definition of any one of those? I'll take inclusion. Okay. So inclusion to me is recognizing that we're all different and accepting those differences and celebrating them. Ooh. In form. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> if you can't explain something in one short, simple sentence, you don't understand it and you just nailed it. So I appreciate that. And I hope Thanks. you can take that. So Leah, I just want to acknowledge you and thank you so much. It's been an honor to be a part of your journey and to see you take the brilliant leadership you had when I first met you and how it just keeps getting more and more elevated and awesome. So I, I want to wish you the best in the continuing on your journey of, of awesomeness. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And so after this, after we hit uh, stop, I'm going to ask Leah what her top five favorite books are. If you'd like to download that, it's our free giveaway today. Just click the link in the show notes. Otherwise, head over to tomearl.com slash blog. Any last minute comments before we sign off for today? I would like to actually thank you, Tom. Tom did a great job um, when he was with Community Tampa Bay. He's always super positive and super, super encouraging. So thanks for having me. This was fun. Oh, my pleasure. And I appreciate that affirmation. So as always, everyone, we're wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you.